national non-governmental organization in Nigeria, working since 2003. She's a seasoned humanitarian with a heart for the marginalized and vulnerable in society. This and her passion for supporting women and children in particular has involved her with numerous organizations, associations and working groups that share her vision. One of these organizations is Ningonet, the non-international, non-governmental organizational organizations network in Nigeria. Secondly, uh, Philippe Besson, started his assignment as the head of the multilateral division at the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation uh, in August 2017. He's been with SDC for 30 years. His unit is in charge of relations with and contributions to the UN humanitarian organizations, as well as the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. His unit uh, also is in charge of disaster risk reduction issues within uh, SDC. And third, uh, my colleague, Katerina Bekorpi, she started her journey in the Red Cross Red Crescent movement as a volunteer with the Italian Red Cross more than 20 years ago, and she has not left since. Today, she's an advisor at the ICRC, uh, headquarters in Geneva. She's in the Movement Cooperation and Coordination Division. And at the moment, she's focused on strengthening the capacities of Red Cross Red Crescent national societies in managing operational security and enhancing safer access to affected populations. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Laura and Megan who are working behind the scenes backstage to help uh, manage the session today. Now, uh, I'd like to start with a, with a poll uh, just to get a, a sense of, uh, of where, you're, where you're all coming from. Uh, um, uh, it's a question uh, that we'll, we'll then share the answers with you uh, just to understand what type of organization you are, uh, are working for. Um, you'll just see one question popping up. If you could answer that, uh, that'll be very interesting to give us a sense of who the participants are today. And while we uh, pull together the, the answers, just a couple of uh, housekeeping uh, points. Uh, I think a slide is gonna come up there. Um, uh, the, the, the session uh, is gonna last 90 minutes. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please do introduce yourself in the in the chat. The the session is being recorded, um, and uh, we do encourage you to to use the chat and to to ask questions. Uh, please join in the polls. Um, don't hesitate to, to to contradict, to share your experience, to to jump in, to add your points of view. We we really welcome that. Um, uh, please do stay muted uh, unless uh, unless you 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 are going to unmute yourself to contribute. Please uh, turn your camera on, especially uh, if you're in the breakout rooms. And uh, for any uh, technical questions, you can uh, reach out to the GISF underscore production in the uh, in the chat. And um, uh, as uh, as I mentioned, we do have a full session. Uh, we're going to have uh, um, a, a section of presentations. We're going to have then a, a group dialogue in, uh, in breakout rooms, and we'll have a panel discussion and a Q&A. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand over to Leah to, first of all, frame this issue for us and highlight the main points to, to help us get started, Leah. Great, thank you, Robert. Um, actually, before starting my own speech, I'm going to ask another question to the audience and I'll ask you to just answer in the chat. And this question is just to get you going, start thinking about where are we going with these sessions. So the question is, what words come to your mind when you think about sharing risks in partnerships? So I'm just going to give you a couple of seconds to pop one word or two in the chat. The question is already in the chat as well. Okay, we have two-way due diligence, responsibility, sharing, duty of care, very important. Yeah, accountability, fiduciary, and it is not just about security, equity funding. Great. Well, I mean, all the positive work that I see here in terms of trust, equity, this is what this session is about. It's about moving towards um, a form of risk sharing that is just more positive and equitable for everyone. So all the people who are attending this HNPW conference, I share at least two things. 
one goal, which is um, to ensure that humanitarian action is effective and reaches those who need it. Because if we didn't care about it, we wouldn't be here. And a common belief, which is that working in partnerships is a good way to reach this goal. Otherwise, it wouldn't be called the Humanitarian Network and Partnerships Week. And it has been great to see and to hear all the discussions and commitments that have been done around strengthening partnerships with local and national organizations, especially. But all these efforts risk to fall short if the local actors they seek to work with aren't safe. So insecurity has been highlighted in the latest SCORE report as the main barrier to access. And in the current context, security risks aren't likely to drop. Threats and attacks from terrorist groups carry on. We see growing repression by authoritarian governments and most recently pandemics. And whereas these security risks concern all aid workers, local NGO staff are often those most impacted by them because they are the first one to respond and the last to leave. In 2019, 94% of the total number of aid workers affected by security incidents were national staff. In 2020, it's 86%. So sharing risk um, in partnerships matter for three main reasons. The first is that crisis affected population won't access the support they need if local NGO staff don't access resources to manage the security risks that they face. Two, without addressing this issue, we are creating a double standard in terms of whose lives matter. Those of international NGO staff versus those of local NGO staff. And three, as we seek to help crisis affected communities, we should remember that local NGO staff very often belong to these very communities and equally deserve to be protected. Last year, TISF conducted a research um, which involved four case studies in Northwest Syria, Colombia, Ethiopia and Myanmar. And regardless of the different levels of risk, the research showed that in all of these contexts, security risks are neither budgeted for nor even discussed in most partnerships. In this context, we must recognize that when local NGOs take on the responsibility for operation, they also take on the associated security risks. And for the moment, they are mostly left alone to deal with them. Some partnerships do score better than others in terms of sharing risk. Some partnerships do include adapted security budget and support, but there is a global need for improvement. And GISF released last week a guide that aims to support local and international NGOs to have these conversations about security risk. And through different tools, the guide suggests that risk sharing requires four main actions. The first is building equitable partnership structures based on trust, transparency, respect, and mutual benefits. The second is assessing, is the need to assess risk together as partners to have a common understanding of what we are facing. Third is discussing and making joint decisions about managing these risks. And finally, the fourth is allocating sufficient funding to implement the agreed measures. The guide is a good first step, first step towards sharing risk. But for change to happen, we need you to put this tool in, into practice. Radical change won't happen in one day, but there are so many small steps that we can take together that will make a difference. And it's not often that we have about 100 people dedicated one hour and a half of their time to this issue. So if you're here, it's because you care about this. So I'm encouraging you to use this time wisely, to be present, and take this opportunity to really think about what is the small step that you can take to better share risk. And just before handing over to Josephine, we are going to do another quick poll to see where you are at in terms of sharing risk. The question should appear. And if you could feel this, that would be great. The question is, would you say your organization shares risk with its partners? Okay, so I'm following the results live. They'll be shared soon. For now, it's more yes, sometimes, yes, often. Yes, sometimes is OK. Well, the situation doesn't look too bad. Laura will share the, the results very soon. But yeah, we just hope that this session will help you to, if you have some good tips in terms of sharing risk, share them with the other participants. And if you're looking for some, then hear the experience from others. And I'm going to hand over to Josephine, um, who will share her experience. 
Josephine, it's you. Yeah, thank you, Mia. Thank you so much. Um, that, that was a very real good brief from your research. Uh, it, it's quite, it's quite like yesterday. <laughs> it's happening today. I, I will take. I just want to thank uh, Leah and everyone who's been behind this uh, conference. It's really a, a privilege for me to be sitting here to talk about what I'm very passionate about. Thank you so much for bringing the local partners to this table, which is almost like what had not been happening, what, what happened many years of my experience show that parties take decisions up there and then they come down to us. But this is really nice. I appreciate you. We're beginning to feel the table, the warmth of the table. So thank you. Uh, I will speak a little bit about the experiences which I have had uh, on the field. In the last 18 years of my life, I have been doing stuff, very little time of work, but I have got some experiences that may, be, may matter. You want to ask what uh, risks do I really, or do us in a local organization really, what really, what do we feel? What do we think about? What's the risk that we face? Is the obvious from adoption to most uh, uh, local organization partners being adopted without uh, not even getting to be reported? We often don't have as much as our partners do, so we, we don't have a lot of logistics to having our own things. Like you have your vehicles, you can manage it the way you want. You don't have that, so when you're in trouble, you need to look for help somehow. And if you get, that's fine. If you're done, then you're doomed. Um, so we're talking about vehicles, we're talking about uh, phones here and there. I mean, everyone knows that if you have this, you're better off than someone who does not have. And the inability to even access information when it's needed most from the INSO, uh, it, it's like a big deal for the local organization to get the right information at the right time. So it is prioritized that you have to be an international organization to access uh, information even when the trouble is up. You know, you, you are in a, at the deep feed when the trouble, when trouble is up, uh, your life is at risk. You have to wait for someone to give you this information. And if it's to do so far, if not, then you suffer. And then the uh, dedicated security staff, you don't have a security personnel that is going to be out there knowing this is my call to be able to support you. Why? Because you don't even have the resources enough to pay the cost staff, what we call cost staff. And so you, you're not even thinking about a personnel and your partner is not even thinking about that. And so I have got a few experiences, uh, some experiences that matter so much to me, like the from partner that we get for parents when we're getting to deep field. It really means a lot to us because it's risky for just getting into deep field when you don't have clearance. And it's difficult to get this clearance without having an international partner who is to help you get this. So we get that from our partners, uh, a few of the partners that we work with. And security updates are given to us. It may be secondhand, but it's useful to us because instead of three minutes, we may have five or 10 minutes information of security, getting security updates. And support that we got much more from the Dutch Relief Alliance, the, the DRAD, uh, is what my staff from being from perishing six of my staff the last time we had challenges on the deep field. Uh, because for, with the that Dutch Alliance, uh, the Dutch Alliance, we're able to procure ra radio, sat phones, we're able to procure those things we needed, alternative power we had at our deep field office. So when they were in trouble, this was very, very uh, on hand to support communication. Uh, the procurement of uh, an installation of all of this was supported by the, what we call joint relief, joint, uh, NJR, the Nigerian Joint uh, Relief uh, Intervention that is going on in Nigeria. As a member of that uh, JR, we're able to get this information. 
and the procurement and uh, support from, I'm also talking about the support we got the last time from NCA, the uh, Norwegian Church Aid, which is also our partners. This was the guys who were up and about when they found out that our staff were left on the field and the, no one was going to evacuate them. Everyone it had left them on field. The uh, ED of uh, Nigeria, uh, the Norwegian Church Aid, was everywhere trying to make sure that the six staff of JDF got uh, evacuated. But unfortunately, the jets were no longer dropping, so they were left on the field. The next slide. Yeah, um, experiences again on this. I'd like to just share a little bit of what I was talking about. On the first day, like you can see on the screen of March, we had a real big challenge in Dikwa. Uh, Dikwa is a local government in the northeast of Nigeria where you have challenges of, uh, of Boko Haram, what we call the AOG now. The, these guys took over the city, the, the local government, and the safest place where we have in Dikwa is supposed to be the UN uh, hub. And when I tried to get my staff into the UN hub, it was already full because the INGOs were already taking position. And so we were also not given room to go in because it was already full. And before we knew it, even the UNDSS focal person was evacuated, leaving my staff to chance, leaving them to a position to lose hope. They were on that field, just breathing to say, well, we see our lives in our hands today. Now the, the, the guys took over, but thankfully, because they have worked nicely with the community members, we were able to see community members, get them out, give them their clothes, take them to one camp from one camp, put them, help them to get into the bush part. And they were, they had to breach the policies of JDF, security policies of JDF, because everybody had left. And those who did not breach these security uh, policies, some of them, uh, cannot be accounted for as I speak. Many of the NGO staff, they can't account for them anymore because no one knows where they are because vehicles and houses of NGOs were burned, they were burned down. But thankfully, the community members in Bifua helped my and they came out, taking their lives in their hand, they came out uh, from the bush part. Next slide, please. Yes. What do I think about risk sharing? I think risk sharing will strengthen the implementation activities of the deep field. When we get money from tax, taxpayers, it's because we want to support those who need assistance. And if we do not strengthen the parts which this assistance gets to the, the, the local community, the, the needed person or the person needing assistance, then we're not sincere. So if we have staff uh, prioritized, the assistance and the taxpayers' money that we get, we'll be able to deliver what they desire, uh, they expected from the taxpayer is. Now, the staff should be prioritized just like every other person. As, NGO, as local NGO staff, their life matter, just like the, the international partner's life. And risk sharing will, will, will show and get the values for true partnership as we speak, let it be implemented. Most times it's a saying, not what we do, but we say so much of what uh, we're yet to do. I know we will do that someday. Yes. So when I briefly speak about the challenges, uh, I would like uh, the changes I like to see it. I will say that let the prioritization of humanitarian workers during emergency, let it be something that is topmost on the agenda as we begin to develop documents or design projects. And as we get into contract, there'll be a percentage that is put aside to say, look, this is for security, right from the donor to the NGO, to the INGO, then to the local partner. And life insurance is just like the accounts of the internal organizations are. Can, can we see local partners also have their staff or the local uh, partners, uh, partners also have uh, 
And we see them also being, being insured so that when they are exposed to risk, they also have confidence that they have insurance to cover. Thing goes wrong. And more funding for humanitarian assets because it's useless if you get money to go do work and then you are not prioritized to get on the jets to take you to deep field because this is the only alternative, the only means of uh, getting onto the deep field. And so when you take all the, the, the international staff and leave the local partner that you are funding, go to field. I don't know what you expect. What do you want to see? So I would want to see more funding for uh, humanitarian aid service to support more flights to deep field. Improve presence and coordination by security forces. Next slide. I'd like to thank you so very much for giving me this opportunity. And for those who are listeners, thank you. Thank you very much, Josephine. That was uh, excellent, fascinating, a real insight uh, in many respects. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Josephine. Now, we, we really want to invite your questions uh, for Josephine. And uh, I, I see a question in the chat box. Uh, what do you suggest we can do collectively to ensure that serious security incidents affecting local NGOs don't go unreported? So this is a question, Josephine, about reporting and how we capture these incidents and how they are shared and how they can feed into the bigger picture about the, the realities on the ground for uh, uh, national NGO staff. Uh, what's your point of view about that, Josephine? Uh, for me, I think that the same way international staff are being reported when they are adopted or when they get hurt, I mean, it's the same thing the mechanism which is standardized is going to the local organization also fit into this process. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are, are there any other questions for Josephine? Uh, uh, Yes, uh, I, I can certainly identify with the comments uh, in the in the side. We're we're going to have um, another chance to uh, uh, discuss with Josephine. Uh, there's going to be a, a panel, and we'll have uh, a, another another opportunity to ask questions and to discuss a little more of the, the points that have been raised. Uh, I'd like now to introduce um, uh, Katerina Katerina Bukorbi. Um, uh, Katerina, can we can we hand over to you? Um, and uh, uh, hear a little bit more about uh, your work and uh, uh, how you see this issue of risk sharing uh, and partnerships, uh, especially from the point of view of the Red Cross Red Crescent movement. Uh, Katrina. Yes, thanks, Robert. I hope you can hear me because I have challenges <laughs> with the IT in almighty Switzerland. Um, Loud and clear. So, <laughs> thanks. Um, just uh, to also to make a um, uh, specification on the terminology it, within the movement for us the the main partners at national local levels are national societies so I will be referring to national societies um, throughout um, if I think about risk sharing and uh, and partnerships and what are the the obstacles or the challenges that we we face um, from an international perspective, there are two elements, two dimensions that I, I think of. One is related to capacity strengthening, and the other one is related to adopting uh, the most effective mindset when engaging with, uh, with national societies. From a perspective of capacity strengthening, I would say that in order to have um, sustainable impact and so to, to make a ma meaningful contribution to uh, the safety and security of, of national societies, we most definitely need long-term commitments and uh, combining this with um, uh, with the proper resources, be it in terms of human resources or, or material support, but also to be very much in sync with what the context needs are, both in terms of affected populations um, or also partners' needs, so the, the national society's needs, because security is very much uh, linked to the kind of services and the kind of actions that national societies carry out. And within the movement, there is also this um, specific challenge linked to this perception. And if we, because 
people don't necessarily differentiate between national societies, ICRC, federation, is all the Red Cross or, or Red Crescent. And so engaging in security risk management and security management means that if national societies um, have challenges in, in doing this, this can reflect an impact on our own security as international component uh, of the movement. And so in terms of specific challenges when it comes to capacity strengthening, definitely for us, it's a matter of continuity of support that we cannot always ensure because we have a high turnout of, uh, of staff, for example, and then to properly budget capacity strengthening from a long-term perspective. In terms of um, mindset, I would say what is striking and what we should probably be uh, doing better is really to adopt a mindset that accommodates and acknowledges different understandings of security and risk concepts. We heard about this even yesterday in the session on global security risk management that the understanding um, of security risks and security risk management from an international perspective can differ from the one of national societies or, or local organizations because the there is definitely the duty of care that we need to uh, to take into consideration but staff and volunteers for example from national societies they are also very part and parcel of the affected population and the context and so for them the risk threshold is different because they, they may be willing to take more risks because it's their own country, it's their own family, which they want to, um, to help when they carry out Red Cross, Red Crescent uh, humanitarian service. And so how do we balance our duty of care from an institutional perspective uh, and their different um, threshold in terms of uh, acceptance of, of risk, for example. And then acknowledge the fact that there are different organizational cultures, that there are different means, different structures available. And so how do we reconcile and make our contribution relevant? What the challenge here is really to um, embark on a co-creation of uh, systems and um, and tools and uh, and structures and so shifting from a long-standing practice and promoting and achieving this behavioral change in terms of organization is definitely um, a key challenge what we have done so far um, as uh, as icrc to to support national societies in capacity strengthening is linked to the safer access framework Safer access is basically working on the link that exists between acceptance, perception, um, and then access and security, and how this cycle perpetuates itself because our access is inherently linked to the degree of acceptance that we have, the perception that uh, communities and stakeholders have of ourselves, and therefore how secure and how safe can be the, the delivery of services. Uh, this sort of framework is something that is owned by national societies. So it really fit, fits and adapts to uh, the, the priorities and the needs of the, of the national societies. And it starts from lessons learned from incidents that happen, for example, um, with national societies, identifying the challenges for access, for perception, for security, and then prioritize actions to address these challenges. So all in all, the, the main need that we have in this, um, in this sense is to be adaptive, to let go of certain schemes and concepts that we have as an international organization to accommodate different understandings and different meanings. And in terms of which changes I would like to, to see in the, in the short term, I think probably that this shift of mindset could pick up pace or like being a bit um, quicker than what we have uh, seen so far. Thanks. Great, thank you, Katarina. Um, and Howard, thank you for your great question as well, because it involves all the panelists will get to it during the panel. Um, I don't see any other question for Katarina, but I have one that is ready. So 
actually, yeah, Katharina, could you tell us, I mean, what piece of advice would you give to other organizations to better share security risks? Um, I think my, my suggestion would be to start conversations with uh, local partners as soon as possible. Like really to engage in discussions of what sharing security risk in practice means and to have these conversations sooner rather than later, even before deciding to engage in a, in a project. And so again, the sooner the better, <laughs> I would say. Yeah, fair enough. And that's something also that our research pointed the need for open conversation. Um, I'm just going to hand over now to Robert. Thank you, Lea, and thanks, Katerina. So we've heard from Josephine from a very, uh, uh, very, very particular perspective, and now uh, 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 quite a different point of view from uh, Katerina. Uh, we'd like to ask you to to take a moment, take a, just a, just a minute or two, uh, for two questions that we want to ask you to reflect on and to uh, give us your answers in the, uh, in the chat. Uh, the, the two questions that we have are, first of all, what do you need to share risks with your partners? So what are you missing now that you, you think you would need to have? And secondly, what resources can you access to help you with sharing risks? Now, the answers will vary uh, depending on where you may be. And we're very interested in getting the different perspectives and uh, using this, uh, 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 this uh, reflection uh, to trigger a discussion. We're going to uh, invite you to join a small uh, group uh, exchange, a small group dialogue for just a few minutes. And uh, we hope that that's a way for you to connect with others uh, on these, uh, on these uh, two questions and related questions. So uh, let me start by um, uh, uh, giving you a moment to think about these two questions and uh, what comes to your mind, please share it in the uh, chat box. And uh, in uh, less, than, less than two minutes, we'll, we'll send you into small groups. We'll then invite you back. If you do need to uh, 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 not participate in the in the small group uh, session, then uh, please do uh, join us uh, afterwards for the panel discussion and the uh, uh, and the uh, the wrap up that we're going to be having. So I, I I leave you now to reflect on these two questions. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Anna, Martin, Godens. Uh, more discussions with partners about their needs and where they are specifically facing challenges. More open discussions, yes. A good network, understanding of the situation, better situation awareness, acceptance and trust. So as I said, that what's missing is common security systems and standards, that's a good point. We work with many partners, uh, each of whom have other partners, and building their capacity is a, is a hard to define idea. Open dialogue, greater understanding of donors and partners about this, about risk management being a priority and that processes take time. Yes, indeed. Perception on the partner's behalf, that it is a risk shared rather than a risk transferred or offloaded mutual understanding. Sharing risk information to build transparency and trust. Yes, information, uh, uh, the aspect of information sharing and access to information is one of the points that struck me most from Josephine's uh, intervention. Now we're going to invite you into a short uh, opportunity to connect with uh, uh, others. Please, uh, please do seize the opportunity and uh, join us, uh, join us uh, in a few minutes when we resume in the plenary. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, this uh, this um, uh, time passed very quickly. Um, just a few minutes, it seemed to fly by. Uh, we were uh, rudely interrupted in the middle of a, of a, of a very interesting thought. And uh, an exchange, and so uh, I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that uh, you're 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 back with us now. Uh, 
what came up in our group, and I, I would like to ask you to, to share uh, maybe some of the main points that came up in your group. What came up on our side was certainly the issue of budgeting and the challenge around uh, uh, being able to define budgets, being able to communicate budgetary needs to donors. That's certainly an important one. And uh, be, being able to have the time, the, the, the capacity, the expertise to be able to, to share risks, uh, being able to connect, perhaps connect other partners. That's also an interesting uh, dimension to this. And of course, uh, access to information, access to, to, to relevant and useful information. Um, can, can I ask anyone who would like to jump in and, and just say a word about uh, uh, of the main points that came up in their group? Would anyone like to, uh, to um, uh, make a comment to, to, the, to, to the plenary? Not right away. Hi, Robert. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Pierre Andy Patton from um, the Australian Volunteers Program in Melbourne, Australia. Hi, um, we, we had a great conversation, and yes, it was cut off prematurely, but that's okay. Um, look, I, I was just in the in the throes of asking a question. Actually, how do we? What what ideas um, do you have around how we can navigate issues around child protection and safeguarding risk? Um, most <clears throat> major international NGOs will have some sort of safeguarding framework. And of course, there are best practice guidelines and codes of practice. Um, translating that to the local level can be challenging. And, and you know, there are all sorts of balances there around um, um, culturally sensitive approaches, locally led development, um, and, um, and just doing that in a way that's empowering as well. So yeah, I, I just wondered if anyone had any pearls of wisdom on that. Thanks, Pierre. That's an excellent question. Terrific. Very interesting. Very, 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 very relevant. Quite specialized. Uh, would anyone like to share an experience or or uh, uh, answer, Pierre? Uh, uh, any ideas or suggestions uh, out there? Hmm. Uh, not not right away, Pierre. Uh, 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 certainly, I can see the challenge, and um, uh, perhaps if there's uh, uh, there are some additional ideas coming in, or uh, if anyone would like to connect directly with Pierre on that question, uh, please do uh, feel free. Uh, would anyone else like to uh, thanks uh, Lisa for sharing that uh, link right there? I hope that might give you some um, some uh, uh, clues and a path to follow up on, Pierre. Uh, I'm looking back at table six. Uh, uh, understanding that security risk assessment is not the same for local and international actors, and there are no blanket solutions. So certainly uh, uh, the context is very important. Uh, even if there's a methodology that can be used, it has to be adapted. Uh, Janine writes that they discuss the importance of an open dialogue between uh, uh, INGOs and local NGOs, absolutely. Generating trust, and open conversations around risk and insecurities and taking up learnings from local actors on the context that they operate in, because of course they have a wealth of experience and knowledge from which to build sound policies. Uh, uh, can I ask uh, uh, Adelicia, would you like to uh, uh, share a little bit, a uh, point, a highlight from your, your dialogue in your group, uh, Adelicia? Um, yes, actually Janine was in my group but just to add to what she just said there, I think the key learning for us is that the relationship will be very different depending on the context in which you are in. So Ukraine will have a certain uh, local um, mapping of partners with certain knowledge, but there are other contexts where it's much more complicated and you might need a little bit more capacity strengthening. Um, so I think being very contextually specific and adaptable in the way you're having conversations and the expectations that the different partners have of each other will need to be you know, adapted to that. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Alicia, thanks for that. I see also uh, Howard's comment, um, similar, uh, echoing what Katrina mentioned about the, the need for long-term commitment, uh, investment over multi-year capacity strengthening. Certainly what we've observed in, uh, in the Red Cross, Red Crescent movement is that these initiatives take one, two, three, four, five years uh, in order to help a, a, a national society to put in place some of the systems and processes and tools that are needed to help them address the, the main risks. 
Uh, Marina writes that uh, uh, she's grateful for all the connections advice uh, and has set up a, 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 a new a new INGO and uh, we're looking forward to continuing the conversation. So the breakout room was nice because we could we could have a have a connection that I hope we can follow up on. Um, can I can I hand over uh, uh, Leah to you for the for the next uh, the next step? Uh, yes, for sure. I just saw that someone had her hands up. Ah, yes. It, Zara. Uh, Zara, yes, please. It, hello, everyone. Yep. Yeah. Do Do you hear me well? Yeah. Yep. Very clear. All right. Just Very a quick clear. one. You know, just just to throw in another perspective because I work with the partners a little bit. Um, you know, in, in the field, the, the, there is this still attitude like a, a patronizing or a older sibling attitude to the partner. And what we have to understand, some of these partners have developed much robust security systems, which may not follow 24 steps SRM process, but they're much robust than us. So it's like it's not us developing their capacity or the vice versa. You know, it's, it's like a, a, um, we are in it together. Uh, but but the very important thing is we are business, humanitarian business, not for profit business. And the business develops what the KPIs are and what brings in money. So un until and unless donors have defined the, the quality of the security risk management uh, that, that has to be there. You know, the NGOs have figured out you have to keep the lower overhead. So you pull off a couple pages from, from Yellow Pages book. Uh, stick it to the local map, and that's your security plan. Check, we have the security system, right? So, so like you get cheap security solutions, which are ex actually a circus solution, not actually security. So unless there is a defined quality and demand for that quality from donors, from the organizations, regardless, local, national, international, whatever it is, you know, I, I think we will be struggling. So I think there's more of a, of a systemic solution with an equal approach rather you know, us helping them um, talk talk with donors and get that into the bottom line. Thanks. Thank you, Zaza. I think that's quite a, a reality check because uh, uh, the 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 nature of the working relationship and the partnership has to be again this point that was raised uh, earlier equitable, and uh, there has to be a, an equilibrium and a balance and a, a mutual interest and an exchange to make the partnership work. Uh, Leah. Yeah, definitely, and agree. As in terms of learning, is that like, goes both ways. That both partners can learn from each other, yeah. and that's the uh, yeah, what partnerships should strive for. But I'm I'm just curious to hear about um, from our panelists what were the opinion on on everything that was just shared. Philip, would you like to comment? Yeah, well, what I see is that uh, we, we have several conversations from different uh, angles and but what comes to the fore is what Josephine has expressed. Um, it's always about the nature of what we call the partnership. And sometimes uh, we we talk of it, but what we mean is a really superficial and um, bureaucratic contractual um, relationship. And what we see is that besides not being, in my view anyway, uh, compatible with, with uh, humanitarian principles and, and principles of humanity, it's also not effective. It's, it doesn't deliver. And um, I, I think this is one thing we, we have really to, to argue about. It's, it's not about being romantic or nice or, or whatever. It's really about doing uh, the proper job. And indeed, I think it's, uh, it's systemic. I, I'll stop there for the moment, thanks. Great, thank you. Um, Josephine? Yeah, this is really interesting to me because I hear, I hear more realistic. I'm, I hear more passionate. Uh, speakers, you know, the conferences and conferences talking about things that we're not doing, but I hear these voices today that freak me, you know, bring him into the point of, oh yes, maybe we're going to get soon, you know, um, I, 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 like, like, the, like Zaza said, we're not without ideas, 
I mean, we have got some very good ideas. We may not have the capacity to fund those ideas. So if you bring us to the table and you ask us, ask of us what we think, we will share with you. I think it's partnership. It will be very interesting that you learn from us and we learn from you, like you said. You know, um, many times we ask local partners for best lives to them. We ask for the account systems. What are your, I mean, what, what capacities of financing do you have? It's only in your interest. It doesn't show that you are interested in this partnership. You're just looking for the security for your money. You're looking for the security for the investment you're bringing. So one, I mean, just a little bit, if the donors also insist to see maybe a little percentage, 1%, 2% of the, I, of the, the INGO who, is going, who they're funding to bring about uh, a security plan, what is going to be your plan for, for sharing risk with your partner? How much are you going to fund there? And then if it is a check from the donor to the NGO, I think this will be realistic enough for them to deliver this because many times this will not come into the RFPs. And I think it's really relevant point, and I'm glad that you're here to share all your ideas. Um, Katarina, would you like to say a final word? Wait. Maybe just a, a quick reflection building on what Josephine just said, because we have heard also a lot about differences, different points of view, different knowledge. So I would say that risk sharing cannot just be uh, a nice desk exercise or a tick the box sort of uh, uh, endeavor. It really needs to start with an honest understanding of what the partners are facing and how they would like to approach it. Otherwise, it would end up being a meaningless uh, exercise. Thanks. Thank you, yeah, it has to be. And I think there are a lot of comments about multi-year funding and like long relationship that we enable a deeper collaboration. We already touched on some of the challenges uh, that and obstacles that we have to share risk with partners. But so I would like to, to ask you, I mean, our panel, what do you see as the main obstacles to sharing security risk and how could we overcome them? So Philip, would you like to, to go first? Well, uh, there are many ways um, one can respond to that. Um, I, I think as we have uh, also witnessed in this conversation, the element of the security risk is sort of an illustration. It's a good indicator of uh, how we perform collectively. And when we forget about this dimension, we, we tend not to, to deliver, as I, I tried to make the point about uh, some, uh, some minutes ago. Um, I would start perhaps uh, strangely enough with the notion of, uh, of awareness. Uh, the, our experts, I speak now from a donor perspective, uh, usually don't understand how, how risk is managed by our local partners. And it's not also central to our thinking, it comes when there is a situation of tension, uh, when, uh, when there's something happening, uh, and then there's sort of a, of a lightning experience where, where then uh, we realize we, we have to, to talk about those things. Uh, there is an issue of mindset. Um, when I was based in South Sudan before the present assignment, uh, they, they sent me uh, a Swiss security advisor um, into our country office. So uh, again, uh, sort of a subsidiary of the, the Swiss embassy. So yes, it's a donor surrounding and all that. But basically the guy had no notion of context. I felt much more safer when when I, I got the chance to uh, to say, okay, thanks very much, uh, go back home and we'll work it out between us, the, our national colleagues and us. So from our perspective, the, 
working in one team with national colleagues, bearing in mind that yes, we have different statuses and all that. This helps bridge the, 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 the gap in terms of awareness and also competence between us and, and the national partners. Also, the, the other experience I had um, wa was um, about doing this collectively, jointly. Uh, we worked a lot with the NGO forum and uh, there were two chapters, there are still two chapters, one is national, one is uh, international. And coming together and discussing about those things and um, on the one hand sharing analysis, uh, uh, news and all that, and I, I must say sometimes also uh, trying to, to get better in intelligence than what UNDSS was delivering us, that, that was uh, building up trust. And that, that helped also uh, even and including in terms of finances and financing things uh, like uh, we did in, in two uh, protection of civilian context, uh, Malakal and Bentiu. Um, suddenly, it wasn't an issue anymore about national or international or whatever. It was really about how do do we uh, protect ourselves collectively and how do we protect each other. So I, I would say it's a mixture between attitudes, behaviors, mindsets, uh, accepting to learn from each other. And uh, on the donor side, it's simply also to, to say, okay, I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to put money into that one. And I, I won't ask uh, head office about it. I, I just go, go ahead. Thanks. That's great. Thank you. And yeah, I think you raised a really important point in terms of collaboration and mutual understanding. Sorry for that. Josephine, would you like to, to add to this? Yeah, um, not so much, but I think this is uh, really interesting. I mean, the first thing I come from here is from last week is I, I, I take out the fact that flexibility helps us to share risk much more easier. If you have flexibility within uh, the context that we're speaking, you need to wait for the just to begin to pick men or pick women out of the field, but you would have a plan. And I always say this both to my team and to everyone I speak to, I say, look, um, risk does not have respect for, for anyone. It does not have respect for, for your status. It does not have respect for my status. When a risk is out there, it's for everyone. So if we look at it from that context or from point of view, then we'll begin to work as partners. And sincerely, I think this partnership needs to be defined. This word partnership is bastardized. We need to define it because say partnership, but on the one hand, you have some boss and some slave down there. So you're not qualified to have a cup of tea in your office, even though the other guy takes a cup of tea in his office. It's the same thing with security issues and the, 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 the issues we're talking about. If you, you see yourself as a partner, you should care about me. I care about you. So I'll share the information just the minute I get it with you. And I, I, I have your back and you have my back. And that way you're going to find us what is going to keep me because it's going to keep you too. So if we're sincere about this and we know that the local partner also has got some capacity that may be you for us, even in risk sharing, then we think uh, a little bit away from what we're having today. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And again, very interesting points in terms of defining the partnerships and actually then putting the words into practice. Um, Katarina. Yes, indeed. And, and since uh, um, this honest understanding of partnerships and assuming responsibility has been uh, so well <laughs> exemplified by what Josephine said, I can maybe um, say something maybe on a more pragmatic level, also on, on tools that we use usually as a way of mitigating risks um, at international level. If we look at those, sometimes they're way too complex and requires a lot of uh, resources that 
um, may not necessarily be available or we may not necessarily be willing to put on the table. So if we're honest with that, maybe it's a matter of um, looking at how we can simplify this and co-create new ones with uh, the national societies or, or local partners because we have heard uh, several times that security risk management shouldn't be something that prevents or blocks the uh, service delivery it should be something that enables service delivery and so if we have um, tools and structures that block the action or um, even worse that um, don't really account for the needs of uh, um, of the partner then we we need to self-reflect uh, a bit more yeah thank you and i think it's exactly as you said in terms of security requirements shouldn't be a burden on two local organizations they should just be neighbors for for more of their work um well going back to more so an international level international perspective I want to ask you, Philippe, a question in terms of what is the grand bargain localization work stream uh, currently doing about the security risk that local aid workers uh, face? And a follow up question, which is how could the grand bargain support local and international organization in partnerships to better share risks? Well, um... What the localization work stream does not do is to single out security risk. Um, so we, we produced in 2026 guidance notes. Um, the, it's, uh, I have to read my notes because I don't know them by heart yet, but it's donors and inter intermediaries. And that's of course a very uh, relevant one also for the, the issue of capacity risk. It's capacity, it's coordination, financing, gender and partnership. If you look at them, in most of the notes, you're going to have a reference to risk sharing. But uh, it's understood in a broader perspective. But then, then again, I, I will re-emphasize the notion that it's a, a, a very smart indicator, the, the issue of how we approach security risk. But, the, the work stream per se addresses the whole range of uh, what is considered also by our national partners, local partners uh, as risk. So there's the element of fiduciary risk, uh, there's the reputation risk and so on and so forth. And I would suggest, uh, I think the adjective systemic has uh, popped up a few times already in this conversation that we, it makes sense to, to approach security risk in the broader context of uh, what, again, we uh, several times referred to, which is partnerships. So it's, a, it's an element of that. And in this sense, it is a knowledge in the work stream. So what, what can the grand bargain do, do more about? Uh, I think, first of all, it's a platform. The work stream is a platform um and so the, this means that um this is a place a virtual place meanwhile in which um also our partners uh, local actors can give us uh, feedback then more specifically what the the work stream is working on now is precisely uh, how intermediaries who amongst donors are considered necessary, especially because of uh, the fiduciary risk element and this, this notion of, uh, objectively speaking, de-risking. So we, we try to, to push the risk back because we don't want to, to have issues with our compliance office, with parliament, with our minister or whatever. And, and so intermediaries in most instances are considered necessary by donors. But then what the intermediaries do uh, with um, local partners, how they foster the relationship, that is an area where we see a, a huge scope for uh, progress. So we commissioned, um, a study and sort of a, of a vision search um, uh, endeavor uh, 
to the humanitarian advisory group HAG, uh, this Australian organization. And we hope that uh, by June, when there is a grand bargain annual meeting, we'll come forward with uh, hopefully very concrete uh, recommendations and sort of a con code of conduct for all of us. Uh, but of course, I'm thinking mainly of uh, the, the, the donor side and how we can engage a meaningful conversation for intermediaries uh, to, to in fact, further develop, install genuine partnerships uh, in country, in context. Let's face it, we are also an industry. Uh, so there is the one poll which is about cooperation and sharing and the other one is about competition and part of the issue and i would argue including in terms of uh, how we approach security risk is, is how we manage to be synergetic uh, how we manage to produce positive incentives and that's basically what we are trying to do together with ifrc who is our co-convener uh, and of course the, the whole uh, the whole group which is uh, open to whoever wants to participate and contribute over great thank you and it kind of the code of conduct that you mentioned kind of reminds me of what josephine was saying in terms of defining what actually partnerships um are so we are having some comments in the chat and questions so i'm just going to ask a final question to you as a panelist and then we'll move on uh, in the Q&A section of this session. It's my final question, because we're looking at exactly how we're moving forward with risk sharing, would be what are the quick wins that we should work on at the international and at the national level to support local NGOs to manage the security risks that they face? And I'll start with Josephine. Oh, well, like I would always say, the quick wins will be um, looking at the documents, uh, because as we speak, people are going to be get out in the field and begin to get uh, contracts out to local organizations. Can we quickly look at the security aspect of these documents that we want to engage in, the contracts that we're trying to pull together and then begin to be the first advocates to ensuring that those who we are getting engaged have reasonably uh, presented a case on risk sharing and its finance. Okay, thank and, you very um, much. Uh, okay. Uh, oh, okay, yeah, it, okay. Sorry, I didn't, I thought you were finished. Continue, carry on. Oh, okay, that's fine. I, I, and then for the existing partnership, uh, it won't hurt to call back and sit together and have a conversation, you know, and, and, and realistically discuss where we are and, and in the face of uh, risk within our communities or within our, the, the context of our work, how can we share risk? What is really your, your strength in, in risk management? And if not, how can we enhance your capacity in ensuring that we share risk and manage it properly? Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Katerina, then. Okay, so uh, a lot has already been said, but about quick wins, I think the main thing would be to really start and take the first step from an international organization's perspective and, and really start and have these honest conversations on what it means in practice to share risks and to assume our responsibility as a partner when it comes to, um, to sharing risks. So to talk about it, to budget for it, and budget means also budgeting for long-term capacity strengthening, which is, an, I'm saying capacity strengthening because it's not building from scratch, is mm -hmm is enforcing or like enhancing something that is already very much there and so capacity strengthening i think is the is the right focus and then to really 
do it. They do joint risk assessments, do joint context analysis, and design jointly uh, mitigation measures. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. Now I'll just hand over to Robert for the Q&A. If you have more questions, put them in the chat and we'll get to you. Robert, you're on mute. Yes, uh, I got to do that muting thing. Thanks very much, Leah. Thanks to everyone on the panel. And uh, thanks for the comments coming in on the side. And uh, uh, I think Janine's question is very interesting. I'm, I'm glad that you that you put that question there, Janine. Maybe we could, we could come back to that one because uh, Howard, uh, you've made a couple of comments uh, just to go back to that point about the grand bargain. And you mentioned that there's a country level dialogue uh, could, could I ask you, Howard, to expand a little bit or make a comment uh, about that to, to respond to uh, uh, some of uh, Philippe's remarks about the Grand Bargain? Uh, yes, just so um, I'm involved in the Grand Bargain localization work stream, which Philippe and his colleagues are sort of co-chairing alongside IFRC. And one of the sort of most interesting initiatives currently underway under the work stream is to convene country level dialogues multi-stakeholder ones on localization in a limited number of contexts and then to see what we learn in, from that level and but particularly to kind of catalyze the dialogue on these issues at the country level rather than it being an extractive thing for the global process but in, I know that Colombia is one of the contexts which was also a, a research focused country for the GISF research on partnership and in safety and security management, which came out end of last year, I believe it was. And um, South Sudan, Nigeria, amongst the other contexts, Myanmar, it was slated, but for obvious reasons is not going ahead. Um, I think there's also a dialogue in the Philippines. And I know in a couple of the contexts, at least the national, it's early days, there's the sort of plan is that the initial phase would happen through to June to coincide with a ground bargain annual review, but definitely there's interest in each of those contexts for the dialogue to then hopefully evolve and kind of obviously they're not going to resolve all the issues by June. So they're probably going to surface what the priorities are, both challenges that need to be addressed or good practices that could be scaled up. And I know from national NGOs in Nigeria, South Sudan and Colombia that are involved in the processes, then each of those processes, risk sharing is one of the themes that they would like to prioritize and table for discussion with the INGOs, the UN agencies and the donors. And they've got some very practical ideas on things that they think um, could be tabled for discussion in such a, a dialogue um, to try and kind of make progress on risk sharing. So. So it's early days. I know there's sort of different working groups being established involving the different stakeholder groups to kind of frame the process. And they're a slightly different place in each context. Um, but uh, yes, um, please, like, I think there's information on the IFRC Grand Bargain webpage, which someone might be able to drop into the chat box and um, with contact details for the leader IFRC supporting that process so if people are interested or or else at least for nigeria colombia south sudan i'd be happy to introduce people to the people that are co-leading the process there if 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 that's helpful thank you thank you howard thanks very much and i hope that those country level dialogues will be able to zoom right into the the security dimension of risk sharing because uh, risk sharing of course is a very broad uh, very broad topic but that's those are those are positive steps and uh, i'm glad to hear about that thank you uh, thank you uh, howard uh, can i can i go back now to janine's question uh, we've got a we've got a few minutes left i think this is a a a, a, a very interesting question uh, it's uh, 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 it's uh, it's something that struck me when uh, when we heard about uh, some of the experiences that uh, that Josephine was describing, um, the 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 kinds of challenges that uh, uh, staff face in uh, Josephine's organization or in other partner organizations, uh, the the difficulties that they're having with with access with access to infrastructure and services, not just about funding itself, but about uh, more broadly, access to information, access to, to systems and, and processes and, and to, to, to what they need to be able to get their job done. 
can I can I put that question to the panel and maybe could I put it to Josephine? To what extent are humanitarian organizations engaging in the dynamics between racism and security management? How do you see that, uh, Josephine? Well, to say about the least, I I would say that uh, there will be there will always be a dialogue. Uh, the end result of the dialogue is what I I cannot tell you. Uh, that we have a dialogue does not mean that we have reached uh, an agreeable point. Whether or not we don't, we know that uh, decisions will be taken. And so um, discussion around some stuff like racism, I don't think uh, it may be an obvious thing for, for us to, to engage, to, to say it's obvious or not. But in terms of uh, the discussion that we're having, um, there have been quite some uh, discussions here and there. That's why I shared the experiences that worked for me. Uh, and like I said, I was talking about JDF, the organization with, that I, I, I work for. And these are the experiences that work for me. And I, I, I think that if they are broadly shared, it, it will bring out those detailed information about what you, the questions that you have just asked me. Thank you, Josephine. Uh, uh, any other reactions on the panel? To that question from Janine, and then Janine, I'd actually like to ask you uh, how, what what you what what you make of that, what you think of that uh, that point yourself. Philippe, please. Yeah, as briefly as I managed to, I, I think that's really a, a very important question because it, it addresses the, the the core of something which is a, a contradiction within our ecosystem. I believe. One is that uh, most of us genuinely want to, to be principled, we want to contribute, we, we want to uh, relieve people, we want to, to, to help. Then, uh, historically speaking, it was the global south that would help the, uh, the global north helping the global south and knowing how to, to, to do it. And I don't know if one may call it racist, but definitely there is an issue of, uh, of power imbalance. And um, we don't like to be reminded of that in the Global North as donors. And it's part of the, the power equation at the global level. But also I would like to emphasize another thing. Yes, we, we invest taxpayers money and the taxpayers they sometimes they they can express a choice but most of the time they just pay their taxes that's it and we are accountable to them too and we shouldn't forget that but what's more important to us uh, to me anyway is that fundamentally we we should work on, on all ends on on this situation of dependency. And I come from a development cooperation uh, background. So when I, I came into the humanitarian sphere, if I might call it like that, uh, I was flabbergasted at the level of dependency. And uh, I, I think there we, we really have to take steps also uh, on, on the local side. What I, I mean by that, if you take IFRC, uh, and the movement at large, there is the notion that the national societies should also become more autonomous in, in terms of uh, financing themselves, finding uh, income uh, income sources, and I, I think that's valid for the, the whole local community. It is absolutely essential, even if it's purely symbolic, that. Um, first responders, local actors manage to, to gather resources um, locally so that they can then go to donors and say, okay, we have organized ourselves as well as we could 
uh, and now you you have to assist and support and accompany and not dominate and I think the way of getting rid of the power imbalance is also about addressing this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Philippe. Thank you. We're we're coming coming close to the to the end of the session. We've certainly covered a, a really a wide range of of uh, very uh, thought provoking ideas. Uh, I want to thank Pierre for this last comment on uh, on these um, uh, inherent power imbalances. I think that's a that's a, a powerful phrase. Um, let me ask uh, if Janine, would you like to say something just for 20 seconds uh, before we go into the wrap up? Would you like to add anything, Janine? Yeah, sure. I think uh, the, the question I asked is more about not um, probably individual practices of racism, but recognizing kind of the origin of humanitarian action um, as, as part of a story of colonialism. And, and I'm, I'm a Swiss taxpayer too. So uh, I suppose in that sense, we, um, I, I'm, I'm uncomfortable without talking about risk management without recognizing where, where these power dynamics come from. And as much as we have to address um, individual practices that are problematic, I think we also need to recognize the systemic inequalities that are giving way to some of these dynamics in the field. So that's kind of why, why I asked that. But thank you for asking the question. Thank you, Janine. Thanks a lot, and a, a great deal of work uh, to be done there. And that's uh, that's uh, decades long. That's uh, that's the horizon. Thank you, Jean, for bringing up the question. Uh, Leah, shall I hand over to you? Um, uh, we we're, we're getting towards the the end of our session. Yes, thank you. I mean, before everyone goes, I just want to say that we have two more questions and a couple of more information to share. So don't leave just right now. But thank you, everyone, for your contributions and, and engagement. And thank you, I mean, in particular, thank you to all of our speakers and my great co-chair, Robert. Um, so in terms of information, so you can access, as I said earlier, you can access the GSF guide on sharing risk, uh, it's partnerships and security management on our website, it's free and the link will be put in the chat. We are also going to be organizing some workshops in May targeted at international and local organizations to start on these conversations around security risk and better share risk. So if you're interested in attending them, please send your email address to GSF production in a private message so that not everyone sees it, unless you're okay with everyone seeing your email address. Um, and finally, if you're interested in uh, other topics related to security, we have a lot of other sessions coming up, uh, looking at acceptance and access but also managing security risk in a digital world and finally adopting a person-centered approach to security, which we'll definitely explore in more depth the issue of racism also and gender and ethnicity and nationality um, with security. So please do join these sessions. And as I said, I have one final question to the audience and then Robert has another one for speakers. But the question that I would like to ask all of you and please put your answer your answers in the chat is what is the one step that you could take this month to better share risk in your partnerships so please just answer this question in the chat we'll wait for a couple of seconds and this is this will be helpful also just for us so that we can source a lot of ideas and after the session, we'll also create a report that summarizes the major learning. So you'll be able to see all of the group reflection on this. Great, so we have be transparent about the unknowns, active listening, working on joint risk assessment together. Perfect, so I'm going to let you write this and hand over to Robert for the final question. Thank you again. One, thank you, Leah. One, one, one very last point for the panel. Uh, in in a word, what's the one takeaway that you will you will bring with you from this session for the panel? Uh, uh, Josephine, what's your one takeaway from this session? Well, I'm beginning to see a little bit of more sincerity in this discussion. We're calling it its name, and so if we begin to answer that name, then we're moving forward. This is what I take away. Thank you, Josephine. Thank you. Katerina, what's your takeaway? Two words, assuming responsibility. Vis-a-vis hmm. -vis 
national uh, partners and local partners, but also vis-a-vis -vis our donors and interlocutors in probably advocating for risk sharing. Mm. Thank you, Katrina. Philip. I'll paraphrase the motto of the 33rd Conference of the Movement. It holds the whole conversation, the power of humanity. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone, for participating. Thank you for all of your contributions. Uh, thank you for the dialogue, the rich exchange. Thanks to everyone. Thanks, Leah. Thanks to the whole GISF team. And uh, we'll let you go now, but uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again in one of the other sessions related to this topic on, uh, on security. And uh, thanks very much. Have a good evening, good day, wherever you may be. Thanks for joining. Goodbye now. Bye.